Everybody good? Okay. All right, well, uh, good morning, and I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank uh, especially those individuals that's sitting out here that I know I saw some of you in January testifying before subcommittee, uh, those that uh, have a real personal interest in this and because you've lost a loved one. And so I want to thank you for being here. This is a great day. And uh, it's been, been a while coming, but I, again, thank you for being here as well. I, I said earlier this morning that uh, your testimony before subcommittee, I can tell you, was very impactful. And I heard that from many members of the General Assembly uh, after, after you spoke. And so we thank you for, for being there and having the impact that you did. Governor, I want to thank you, all the members of the General Assembly, uh, Representative Gillum, uh, for his support. Uh, the legislative session, the governor and leadership of the House and the Senate, and members worked all hand in hand with law enforcement stakeholders Come on down. <laughs> Come on. I just spoke your name. <laughs> so they worked hand in hand with law enforcement stakeholders to pass strong legislation that will hold high level drug dealers accountable. Fentanyl continues to pour across our border and into South Carolina at a rate that we've never seen before. Both quantity and lethality of this drug is unprecedented. Recently, SLED and local law enforcement seized 44 kilos of fentanyl in Horry County. That is enough to kill our state's population four times over. Just yesterday, we, along with local law enforcement, seized an another approximately 200 grams in Aiken County, again, enough to kill 100,000 people. This legislation ensures that traffickers that are peddling this poison in South Carolina are subject to serious prison sentences, including mandatory minimums. According to a report published by DHEC and DeOtis in February 2023, from 2020 to 2021, the total number of drug overdose deaths in South Carolina increased by 430 individuals. That's 1,734 deaths to 2,168, an increase of more than 25% in one year. By comparison, in 2012, there were only 573 drug overdose deaths. Opioids continue to be the primary cause of overdose deaths in recent years, contributing to 1,733 of the 2,168 overdose deaths in 2021. Nationally, including South Carolina, fentanyl is largely responsible for the increase in overdose deaths. Again, from 2020 to 2021, drug overdose deaths involving fentanyl increased by 35% in South Carolina. From 1,100 to 1,494. Fentanyl was involved in more than two-thirds of all opioid-involved overdose deaths in this state in 2021. Lastly, and importantly, this legislation creates a new felony possession of firearm or ammunition offense for drug dealers. Offenders who are previously convicted of possession with intent to distribute, distribution, manufacturing, and trafficking will now be prohibited from possessing a firearm in South Carolina and be subject to up to a five-year prison sentence. It is past time that we hold drug dealers that use guns accountable. I have said many times that we are losing an entire generation of young people due to illegal guns and drugs. I believe that this legislation serves as a deterrent to anyone who seeks to profit from this deadly drug. We must do everything we can to reduce supply and save lives. Again, this is strong legislation, 
and I am grateful to all our state's leaders in law enforcement, victims, families, for getting this legislation signed into law. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Luke Rankin on behalf of the, the uh, Senate Judiciary, and I just want to echo the comments made by our chief law enforcement officer of this state. This is a tipping of the hat to those of you who have suffered, those of you who are here on behalf of others who have suffered, and it is high time our state has recognized the call of our citizens as well as law enforcement. And the last point that Chief Kill made is one of the most important. If we in the General Assembly will listen to what law enforcement asks for and wants, just like fentanyl, we are doing justice by our people and for our state. And so, Representative Gillum, I'm turning it over to you as the chief sponsor, and thank you for your effort and the loss that you suffered in your own family. Hey, I want to tell you, first of all, I apologize for coming in late. I left my house. It said I'd be here at, at uh, 9.30, and then I got, I was going to try to miss 26, going to back roads, and it took me to Broad River Road, Pomeria. And then I had to get back on 26, and then I got stuck in traffic. <laughs> but, but I am glad I'm here. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for all y'all that have come. Just to tell you a quick story, I won't be long, about how this come to be. We all seen in the newspapers, on the news, reading about it, about fentanyl killing um, our people. And I said, we're gonna do something. And I called Chief Kill. I said, Chief, this is my intent. I'm gonna put in a bill uh, to stop, try our best to stop as much as we can of fentanyl trafficking. I said, would you like to participate? He said, absolutely. I told him when our legislative council was gonna sit down and try to draft this bill, he sent not one, not two, but three agents. Uh, he sent uh, Major Frank O'Neill, uh, Wendy Bell, Captain Wendy Bell, and Ryan Alf, and they sat down with legislative council done us very well. Uh, Samantha Allen, Zeb Williams, and, and Elizabeth Taylor, they really done good helping us draft a solid, firm bill. And that's what we come out of this with. So I sat down with some of our representatives. If you'll see behind me, we had almost 50 co-sponsors on this bill just from the House of Representatives. And I'm proud of them and thank y'all all for being here. So I sat down, Representative Pope and Representative Wooten had put in a bill too, so we sat down together, put three together basically, made the best one we could for our state and our people that will have teeth when it comes to taking a bite out of the traffickers. And I appreciate all of y'all that come and testified in our subcommittee meetings. That meant a lot, and it was an impact on the people of our subcommittee. Jeff Johnson, Weston Newton, they fought this bill through the committees. We got it to the floor and passed it. The Senate tagged on to the additional gun and ammo charges at the end. It took a team, even from our 16th solicitor, Kevin Brackett and his team, helping us to get all this done, folks. It took a team effort. And I'm telling you, I was very proud when it come through and passed the House and the Senate because I know our governor was gonna sign that. You know, it takes a team. Thank y'all for being here uh, and letting us represent our people and what we've done. I think, too, it's gonna take a bite out of this. Hurt, we had our Police Chiefs Association, J.J. Jones, Jared Bruder from the Sheriff's uh, Association, it took all of us, folks, and everybody played a part in that. So it ain't just one person. It was a team. And I appreciate y'all all for being here. And thank you for letting me say something. Governor, thank you. I'm not a public speaker, so just bear with me. As I look at the faces here um, on this front row and realize that all of these ladies here that I know that have lost a child I'm speaking for all of you. So good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of South Carolina parents who have lost children to fentanyl, the most dangerous drug this country has ever seen. The number one killer of ages 18 to 45. 
There are so many people who have worked hard to get this bill, H3503, to the desk of our governor, Henry McMaster. We recognize Tommy Pope, Harvey Peeler, Brandon Guffey, and our York County solicitor, Kevin Brackett, among many others, for strongly supporting getting this bill signed into law. We recognize the efforts of our governor for sending troops to the southern border to not only protect South Carolina, but the entire country from the cartels and the drugs pouring into this country. He is a governor for all people. Since Governor McMaster signed the fentanyl possession and trafficking bill into law in June, we are happy to announce it is already working. These traffickers and poison peddlers are ended up, ending up arrested and charged with a crime. No longer will we hear the police say, we're sorry, but there's nothing we can do. Our police officers, officers now have the law on their side and are using it. I speak not just for our group, Fentanyl Kills You, but for all families in South Carolina who have lived through the horror of walking into your child's room or apartment and finding them dead, of getting the phone call that says, I'm sorry to tell you, your child is gone, making the decision to take them off life support because they are brain dead. We have had that unthinkable experience. We don't want other families to know what that feels like. That is our goal and what we work toward. That's what the passing of Bill H3503 means to us. Our dedicated governor, legislators, prosecutors, and police officers who care about the lives of the people in this state. That South Carolina has stepped up and done the right thing to protect our children, families, and citizens of this state. Today is not about me or my son or any one particular person. It's about all of us who have seen the damage fentanyl does to families, the unthinkable pain, to the hundreds who have died in our state, to the tens of thousands who have died in this country from this poison. We remember you. We remember your smiles, your laugh, your love of life, for the memories that we made and the lives that were taken too soon. We miss you. We fight for you. This is not the end of our fight. It's too late to save our children, but this law just might save yours. Our children deserve this and more. In closing, the passing of Bill H3503 lets traffickers and manufacturers know we have watched you come for our children, and now South Carolina is coming for you. Governor McMaster is famous for saying, South Carolina is open for business. We are proud to stand with him and say, South Carolina is closed to fentanyl trafficking and manufacturing of poison. Thank you to our Governor Henry McMaster. We know you are with us. When people ask me why I'm so passionate about topics like fentanyl, I think of people like Patty and her husband David, who's back in the corner, and all the folks sitting down here on the front row wearing their t-shirts. These are the people that we meet every day in our offices, me, my colleagues, a couple of whom are here, Solicitor Wilson, Solicitor Stone, law enforcement officers across the state. We meet the best people under the very worst circumstances, and we feel helpless. When all we can do, when all we can do to a guy caught with 30 kilos of fentanyl is say, you're facing zero to 15 years, you'll be eligible for parole in about three. Enough fentanyl to kill everybody in the state. That's why we do the things we do. And I'm so grateful that the General Assembly stood up this year and said enough is enough. I'm grateful for the leadership shown by Representative Gilliam, uh, Tommy, the York County delegation who I deal with the most. These are the folks that I talk to. Heath is here somewhere um, behind me, I guess. There he is, Heath Sessions. 
uh, uh, Tommy Pope, our, our uh, Senators Clymer and Michael Johnson do a wonderful job, always reliable uh, allies, Senator Hembry. Um, these are people that we call on on a regular basis. I want to thank everybody who had anything to do with the passage of this bill and the people in my office. Uh, my drug team, Marina Hamilton, Austin Newman, Dan Porter, who reviewed countless different versions of this bill, looking through it to make sure that it was going to be as effective as we possibly could make it. Uh, all these folks had a hand in this, and I want to recognize them now. This will result in that same guy who had 30 kilos going from 0 to 15 and you're parole eligible in just a few years, plenty of time to get back into business. Now that guy will be facing 25 to 40 years mandatory. <laughs> no parole. You go do that time and let your sentence and the time you spend in our Department of Correction serve as a stark warning to anybody else who might want to come here and peddle this bill. It is a huge move forward for us, and I'm so grateful. But I will say that it's the first thing that we need to do, but not the last. You saw, Patty, if you knew these people like I know them, you would know these are good people, good families that raised good kids that somehow got off the tracks and this resulted in their untimely death. We need to do better by the people who are addicted to this stuff too. We need to provide quality rehabilitation opportunities for them. There's two things an addict needs to overcome their addiction. Meaningful access, or access to meaningful rehabilitation and the second thing is the motivation to embrace recovery. And the motivation comes for too many people who are arrested from knowing that if you don't embrace recovery, you could go to jail. And you will go to jail. That needs to be a reality. I forget who said it in the subcommittee meeting in the House. I wish that my son was in prison. I wish that he was in prison at least I could go visit him there. I can't do that now. There are so many people out there who can turn their lives around uh, and will turn their lives around if we give them the opportunity to do it. I'm, I'm pleased to say that the solicitors uh, just met last week and we've been talking to law enforcement who also recognizes we're not going to lock our way up out of this problem. We've already begun discussions with uh, folks in the General Assembly uh, to uh, get some meaningful reform for drug court, forcing people to embrace recovery, giving them the option of rehabilitation or real prison time. That's the thing that drives people into recovery. That's the thing that makes them. We can't just keep putting people on probation. Once you get a chance and you don't take advantage of it, the next opportunity needs to be, well, you're going to go to prison or you're gonna go into rehab. And people will take that option if we give it to them. So I look forward to continuing this fight. It's too late to help y'all. I'm so sorry for your loss, but it's not too late to help the countless thousands of other South Carolinians who are out there struggling with addiction. And we can do it, we will do better. Thank you so much for everything. It's great to be here today and I want to, <laughs> I want to, uh, it's my privilege and my honor, since I'm the second, the penultimate speaker, I get to introduce our, the best governor in the best state, a man who understands the needs of public safety because he has deep roots in public safety. This was the first U.S. attorney appointed by President Ronald Reagan back in 1981. He has gone through it and done it all. He was our attorney general. I worked with him when he was the attorney general. He is a reliable ally and a good friend of public safety and law enforcement. It's my privilege to be here and to introduce Governor Henry. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. I appreciate that nice generation, uh, introduction. Of course, we all know that nobody does anything by themselves. And I, I want to tell you all, having spent a good bit of time in other, other states, other parts of the, the country, that there's no final law enforcement in the whole world in what you see standing before you and represented by these legislators who are doing the right thing and law enforcement who are making it happen. And 
there on the street. There's no comparison between what we have here and what they have in other places. All you have to do is watch television and you see how things are falling apart. <clears throat> and then you come here and you see how we are acting together as one to stop these, these horrible crimes. Uh, Doug Gilliam uh, arrived. We kind of like this, this bill arrived a little late, but did arrive. <laughs> <laughs> it finally arrived. But it took a while, but you see by the number of the people here, we usually don't have this many people that are involved and, and deeply in, involved that, that also make the time to come despite their schedules to celebrate something. So this, this group that you see before you now not only represents South Carolina well, but is an indication of the spirit and the strength and the determination to stop this from happening. We know that young people don't have good sense. We know that. You can't tell them. You can't teach them. Everybody gets into trouble, it seems. And recently, there's been scientific evidence about the formation of the frontal lobe in the brain and all that. It has a judge. So you can't, we can't stop them. But one thing that we must do is stop those who would prey upon them. <clears throat> and that is why we're here today. This is a big step. This puts teeth in the law against perhaps the most dangerous substance that we've ever had in the world. It's manufactured all over the world. It's shipped all over the world from country to country. They say the, the drug trade of all, all drugs, not just fentanyl today, is, is about 1% of the gross domestic product of the whole world. And drug business is big business, and it's illegal drugs that are that big, and they're everywhere. So what we must do is stake our claim plant our flag in South Carolina and tell these criminals that if they come in here, they will be in for the experience of their lives. And that's what we're doing today, adding one more strong pillar in our fight for the safety of our people. I often have the opportunity to refer to businesses from around the world that want to invest hundreds of millions and billions of dollars in our people in our state. It's always because of the people. So our job is to see that those people are educated and that they're safe, that the businesses are safe, that we can keep those people safe so they can grow up, so they can get educated, they appreciate the great beauty of our state and live long, happy lives, and make their parents and all their relatives happy. But we see we have that opportunity. I believe in the next few years, South Carolina is going to grow and prosper and become stronger and a, even a better place to live than it is now. And it's because it, we have come to the realization of a lot of things that we must emphasize, our education, our economic growth as, and development, as well as our, our natural and cultural heritage. But we have to keep the people safe, and that's what we're doing. But our South Carolinians have also worked to keep other parts of the country safe not only by drugs that would pass through here, but also by drugs coming into our country. And we've had 150 National Guardsmen down at the border for over a month. Uh, Governor Abbott asked us to send them, asked all the states, many of us did. And most of them, when they got there, they didn't want to come back because they knew what they were doing is important. And one of the things they're doing is keeping that fentanyl from, from coming in. I want to thank everybody here for, for what they've done. For those of you whose tragedy, your tragedy, will likely produce joy in others in later days. But also uh, Senator Rankin, who was indispensable in the Senate, Representative Gilliam, who brought the matter to everyone's attention, and everyone involved in putting this into the law and making it clear that this is the worst place in the world for drug criminals to participate. So we are in the business of making South Carolina the best place in the world to work, live, and raise a family. And we've taken another step to making it even better. So thank you to everyone for doing what you have done. And now, if, if anyone has any questions, now's the time. Senior correspondent Joe Bustos. Yeah. 
how often? How many? How often? I, I don't know a, a total, but I mean, we're seeing them every week. I mean, it's, uh, it's common that we're seeing them every week. Well, both. I mean, uh, there are cases where uh, drug dealers are selling one drug, or they say it's one drug, and it has fentanyl in it. And then there are cases where individuals are continuing to look for something stronger to get more of a high, and, and they, they take that chance on uh, thinking that they'll get a dose that's not lethal. And what's been the Well, I was reading, uh, you know, it was created, created, I think, back in 1959 as an intravenous uh, anesthetic. And it was to be used in surgical, you know, in, in, in surgery. And so um, it's not designed to be used, you know, by individuals out on the street or taking it in their home. I mean, that was not what it was designed for. And uh, so it's just, a, again, it's a very strong drug. It's, 50 times more powerful than heroin, 100 times more powerful than morphine. And so that's what you're dealing with. Do you know how many people have been charged with this statute? I do not know that at this time, no, sir. Has anyone been charged? Yeah. I'm sure that they have been. Yes, we've had several charged in New York County. We signed it into law about 15 minutes after it passed.
So I agree, and, and this, uh, we need to attack this problem from both the supply side, which this bill does, and the demand side, which is the people who are yes. addicted. It, it needs to be, we need to reimagine our approach to addiction and, and, and addiction recovery and provide people the resources, whether they're charged or not. Um, but the reality is, is that too many people, because our approach in the last 10 or 12 years in South Carolina for sentencing for possessory level offenses has been probation, thinking we can, we can fix these people through probation, and a lot of them aren't getting the help that they need or they're not embracing recovery because they don't perceive a downside. They don't think that they're going to go to jail. They don't fear that as much. Um, so my drug pop, my drug court population has dropped from 2008, nine. We had about 45 people in there. We have about 15 now. In the middle of an opioid epidemic, my drug court population is one third of what it used to be. So we need to fix that. People need to understand. We'll work with you uh, on the first offense. But after your second offense, when, when your criminal behavior is being driven by addiction, you need to have your choices limited down to rehab or jail. That's the, the fire under the pot that makes them realize that's the rock bottom they need to hit to go, okay, I need to change my life because I don't want to go to Kirkland Correctional. So that, that is exactly right. Now, for folks who don't get arrested, we need to make sure that there are 24-hour access to rehabilitation. The problem is getting people to stay there because you, you can check somebody in, but unless they're involuntarily committed, they can leave. And the addiction is so powerful, they frequently do. And that's the, that's the tragedy for... It, it is, and I understand, I understand that too. Um, and I also know, like, Exville County, uh, my son actually died in Exville County. Um, but I know Exville County Sheriff's Department joins with the program with Tech. Not a lot of uh, South Carolina County groups in the program. Not that they got, not one that I know, but that's, excuse me, it's a program where if you have been administered Narcan, Yes, ma'am. And I'll be, are, are, is, Clifton vo is Clifton's voice your program? Why don't you stick around? I'd like to get your information, and we'd love to have your, uh, your voice in that conversation. But, uh, again, I'm thankful for this bill. Yes, ma'am. I am very thankful for this bill, because it was very, it was very good. Um, but I Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Press, any more questions? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, sir. It's killing people every day. Yes, sir. And this is the deal, if y'all, and I know, I believe Chief Kill probably spoke about this. One of my points that I was going to climb the hill for because I read it and seen it every day on the TV and in the news, it was, um, it ain't just the fentanyl that's in the drug now because they are taking pill, pill presses and pressing them into other drugs and they are getting something that don't realize they have and it is, it is killing them. And that's why we was gonna take the total weight 
not just how much fentanyl is in it, but the total weight of that pill, and they will be held responsible if they do lace those drugs and someone takes them, thinking it is someone else, something else. That is exactly the reason why that is in there. Thank you. I agree with you, sir. That's in the House, and they're going to give that quick work in January. That is, that, that is S-1 that the Senate passed, and I have good faith and confidence that that will be uh, Action 1 by the House. We will be there. Very good. <laughs> we're, we're looking forward to it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I, I think this excellent press conference has turned into an even better hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, thank you very much.